This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. And with me today is Dr. Allison Nugent. Welcome, Allison. Thank you. Allison is a uh, professor at the, in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences uh, in SOAS, the School of Oceans. Uh, Ocean Earth Science and Technology. O Ocean Earth Science and Technology. OK, <laughs> I can never remember that. Uh, they're at UH Manoa. Uh, fairly new here. You came here, I guess, in 2017. Yeah, uh, after a, a very stellar uh, graduate career, well, undergraduate at Harvard, graduate at Yale, uh, both a master's and PhD, won presentation awards and best graduate student award or something like that. Uh, has ver various, uh, all kinds of multi-talented, she's developing, you're developing a course with Python and MATLAB to help com get computing sciences into the, the work you do. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff. But you know, likable science is all about how science is useful and applicable to our daily lives. And so that's, of course, what we really want to talk about. So you study clouds, basically, clouds and mountains, really, which are part of our daily lives, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. always present, and particularly on small islands like this. So uh, what, what got you involved in it? How did you get interested in this? Did you grow up thinking you were going to go and study clouds? Yeah, that's a great question, because a lot of people who study meteorology got into the science by having uh, a storm memory, maybe some hurricane affected them when they were a child. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't my story. I just, I love the outdoors and I love being active and I, I'm, I like to look around and see what's there. So I, I guess I kind of fell into it in college where I liked sciences and the people that were doing outdoorsy things were the ones who were studying earth science. Huh? So, okay. so I went to college thinking I might be a doctor, and I ended up being an earth scientist instead. <laughs> okay, so if operating yeah. on people, you operate on the planet. Now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do geoengineering, right? Um, in particular, you, you look at the interactions between mountains, island mountains, and sort of the, the prevailing weather patterns, right? And how the mountains in, influence the the weather, right? Yep. And that's a, that's a it's a a big and important area, right? If Clearly, if we in Hawaii did not have mountains here, our weather would be very, very different, right? Can yeah, you, absolutely, very different. We can see, and we'll see at the very end of the show, a, a map of the rainfall. And you'll see the one very low Hawaiian island has much less rainfall right, than all the others. But um, so, so maybe start with a quick uh, talk a little bit about clouds and, and sort of people don't understand, like clouds just appear and people sort of think of them as things that always exist and the clouds come, the clouds go. But they're very dynamic, right? Yeah, I think that, that's a great point that clouds, they're just always there. They're not something that you often think about and yet they play a huge role in our day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, like what are the clouds, that, what do the clouds look like today? Uh, it's a, a lightly <laughs> cloudy, I guess I would say, but mostly clear. Right? Yeah, but a you might you might not have noticed. Clouds, I don't know. Yeah, but if you if you start to recognize cloud patterns and you keep an eye on them, you can notice weather patterns. And you can't get rain without clouds, right. so that's one. But also the way they look and the way they're shaped tells you a lot about the weather. Okay, so that's that's interesting. I'm, I'm going to take a, a little side step here. When I was a child in Florida, there would be, as far as I can remember, completely clear blue skies, and it would start pouring rain. <laughs> really? Uh, and people you just have told me other, what I other, said. other people have said that's impossible. It had to have been clouds there. And maybe there were. I just huh. maybe I'm not remembering them. But uh, I just remember it would seem to be bright and sunny out and pouring. And I guess maybe there were random clouds I wasn't noticing. But was the wind strong? Not particularly. No. Just. Mm -hmm. Anyhow. Okay. Um, so, so let's talk about what a cloud is. Right, then. exactly. So, so a cloud is just composed of millions and trillions of tiny little water droplets. They're, mm -hmm. they're of a scale that you could, probably can't see with your, uh, with your own eye. Okay. Maybe about one micron okay. or 10 microns. Okay. Um, and clouds are just an uncountable number of them. Okay. Um, a cloud touching the ground is the same as fog. So if you've mm -hmm. hiked Kulio'o, ridge or something and you've been in the foggy area that's a cloud touching you and right. you can see it just kind of feels wet just right. moist and so what happens is that as air is lifted 
Hmm? It finds air that has lower pressure, mm -hmm. and so it expands. As it expands, its temperature cools. Mm -hmm. And the same thing that happens on a warm, humid day where you have a cup of water that gets wet on the outside, you have condensation occurring where it's cooler. Mm -hmm. same, things hap same thing happens. You have condensation occurring in your cooler air. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you can get a cloud that way. Right. It has to condense yeah. around something, typically, right? True. And, but that something can be as small as a, a, a single crystal of salt or a tiny bit of grit or a, a dust fleck of some sort, right? Yeah. They're, they're called cloud condensation nuclei, right. or CCN. And it's just right. a, a surface on which water can condense. Right. Because typically, yeah. yeah, you need something to start the condensation process around right now. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's very interesting because we think of rainwater, of course, as being very clean, and yet you realize each droplet there has to, has to have something other than water in it, really. To, to yeah, and not only that, it takes well, approximately one million cloud droplets to come together to make one raindrop. Wow. So that means there's okay. one million particles of stuff right. in each your raindrop. raindrop. Huh? Yeah. And yet rainwater still is generally clean, quite drinkable as it falls mm -hmm. from the, the sky more problems get to be after it's hit surfaces yeah. and started picking up stuff off the surfaces, right? Yeah, and maybe a, a good point to mention would, would be that while, while you have that stuff to condense onto, sometimes it dissolves in the water, or sometimes it's a gas phase particle. So in the water, it may not be like... Grit. <laughs> grit, as you described it. It may actually just be dissolved in the right. water. Right, and indeed, yeah. if we drink distilled water, people don't tend to like the taste of it very much because it has no mm -hmm. sort of no taste at all. You actually want a certain want small amount of salts and yes, yeah, some minerals and, and things in your water, right? Yeah. So in particular, yeah, you, you talked about this and it's called orographic precipitation, right? Which is when the when the warm, moist air rises, as you say, expands, cools, and condenses into clouds. And that happens typically on one side, in this case in Hawaii, on, on Oahu here, sort of on the north, northern and eastern fronts of the mountains, right? Yeah. Because that's where the, the prevailing winds are bringing in the, the Yeah, air. where you have where you have rising air, right. you'll get a cloud, and when you have sinking air, no cloud. And so on the windward sides of mountains where air is being lifted, that's where clouds form. And on the lee sides, mm -hmm. like over here in Honolulu where air is descending, you'll have less cloud. Right, and this is why we have, from where I live in Waikiki, we get 23 inches of rain per year or something, and just up at the top of the ridge, so I can see from my own eye, they get 150 inches of rain per year or something insane like that. Yeah. And, and even in this just a, a three or four mile shift, you, you've got this tremendous six-fold difference in, in rainfall because that's high mm -hmm. up on the mountains. It's sort of, I think of it as almost combing the water out of the air in a sense. Uh, Perhaps a yeah. bad analogy. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. <laughs> I think it's something, well, it depends on the case. It's called the drying ratio, or how much moisture the mountain can extract from the air. Mm -hmm. And in the tropics, it's typically less than a percent. It's actually been shown that the incoming moisture gets mixed upwards into the atmosphere mm -hmm. rather than yeah. being rained out. So it's not that there isn't enough moisture left to rain on you when you're on the lee mm -hmm. side of a mountain. It's just that that moisture has been mixed upwards, and so it's not necessarily coming down on the lee side. That, that, that's but intriguing. Fun I, fact. I, I wouldn't guess it only, only dropped 1% of it. Uh, yeah. You think in, that... it, well, in mid-latitudes, it can be much higher. Oh, so okay. if you have, um, so if, for example, the Cascade or the Olympic Mountains sure. in, in Washington, where you have stratiform rain just pressing up against mm -hmm. the mountains, those mountains can extract much more, maybe 40 or 50 percent of the moisture. Oh. But here in the tropics, because we have clouds that, that grow upwards uh -huh. and convect upwards okay. um, in buoyant circulations and motions, then the air is mixed, the moisture is mixed upwards oh, instead so. of raining out. So oh, it's I very see. different depending on where you are on the globe. Interesting. Yeah, uh, a great, great yeah. subtle difference. <laughs> I, I had yeah. no, no idea about that. So, um, and, and this makes uh, tremendous impacts in terms of, uh, you, you talked about, it's called the rain shadow, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is a, the, the dry space on the other side. It's very evident, for instance, on the Big Island, right, where there's a virtual desert on, on the west side of the big mountains, whereas on the mm -hmm. e east side, it's, it's quite, uh, uh, quite wet. Yeah. And you know, again, you see, as you mentioned, the Cascades, right? You drive up the Cascades on one side, it's all dug fur, and the moment you go over the crest, it sh it's shifts desert. to become a pine forest and a, a high altitude yeah. desert, right? Yeah. Yeah, and these things are, they're, they're all over the world. Every island, every mountain, every 
consonants with a mountain range has these huge differences in precipitation on one side or the other. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you said what it was, which is orographic precipitation, but I think most people don't know what orographic means. Right. Um, so orography is just kind of another word for topography. It just means mm -hmm. um, precipitation that's controlled by mountains. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And in islands particularly don't have any mountains, like in the Marshalls, they typically get a lot less rain, right? You, there are ways because of those are atolls and there's rising warm air from the shallow lagoons that they, they generate a little bit of their own weather, but it's, it's nothing like what happens on, uh, on these mountains. And they, this, this is critical, particularly for our islands, right? Because this is essentially where all of our fresh water comes from, right? I mean, we have no other fresh water source, basically, other than what falls on these islands. And gradually mm -hmm. over time, we've sort of filled up aquifers uh, porous spaces in the rock, open spaces, and that's where we, mm -hmm. we generate all of our water. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. Ecosystems and, and rely on these, and waterfalls, and freshwater fish, and right. like a, a cloud forest. You know what a cloud forest is? Right. These are these are <laughs> forests that, that essentially get all their moisture out of the fog or the, the clouds. That yeah, it's not run necessarily from rain. It's from right. actual cloud touching. Right. The, the plants and yeah. Right, and, and there's now uh, people, particularly in drier climates, are trying to work on similar ideas and, and put up dew fences or fog fences to try to do the same thing and get yeah. drinking water out. To extract water from the atmosphere from, from, without having right. to make rain. Yeah. Right, and there, there are groups that are commercializing this technology in various other ways too now, um, mm -hmm. doing some very high tech things. Um, what's the group down in Arizona that's doing this? I don't now blanking mm. on their name. Uh, they have mm. sort of what look like solar panels, but they're actually structured, they're structured with pores in them that are very, just the right sort of size and shape to let water molecules pop in and then they're cooler on the other side so the water begins to condense almost immediately. Oh, that's and, a good and, idea. <laughs> and they can actually pour water out in Arizona, pull water out of the air, which is sort of amazing when you think of it, right? That is pretty amazing because yeah. it's very dry there. So yeah. let's take a quick, um, quick look at a, a picture too. Uh, you can just start with the first image maybe. Clouds, right? Everyone everyone knows them. Cumulus clouds, I believe. Yeah, these are cumulus clouds. My, my cloud types. Yeah, cumulus because they're convective, so you can see they're bumpy on the top because there's m fluid motions inside. Right, air is warm, air is rising up and then cooling and all. And the next yeah. image will show some, I think, an unusual shape, right? Clouds. Yeah, I thought this one was cute because right, it, it kind You're of looks right. like a dinosaur. dinosaur or a, a <laughs> swan, maybe. You know? Yeah, uh -huh. just to make the point that oftentimes when we look at clouds, we're not thinking about the role they play in the environment. You're just looking at them as, oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> right. Yeah, okay, that, that's good. Yeah. And, um, but clouds, we talked about, they are uh, more, more dynamic, right? And Maybe we got time here to do a quick little first video of that um, that, that shows sort of a view that not everyone has seen, right? Yeah. Going through a cloud, right? So this is from a... You, yeah, this is a, a video, a time-lapse video as an aircraft is flying through a cloud or mm -hmm. through, the, through clouds over a mountain in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And the little thing you see on the corner is actually a gust probe. It measures the three components of velocity. So sometimes you can see the clouds growing right in front of you. You see some rain going okay. across the, um, the windshield of the airplane. But I love this video because it shows how, how clouds are so dynamic. Right, right. Yeah, um, and we can see a little bit of that uh, if, if you look up, for instance, over the, the, the ridge, the mountain ridge here on Oahu. And, and, and over time, you'll see the cloud patterns change. Sometimes there's very, very few clouds, no clouds, other times. You can't see the tops of the mountains, right? They, they are they are shrouded, uh, and it, then this we see the downstream effects <coughs> on, in terms of I, I overlook the Alawai uh, Canal, and right sometimes that canal is reasonably clean looking, <laughs> and other times it's it's basically chocolate brown. You know, <laughs> but when, yeah. After those clouds have formed there, and you know been been pouring the water down, so uh, this is this is great stuff because it really impacts what how much water we have, right, and, and, and what we can do. What, is it a, a drought or a, a flood or uh, anywhere in between? And, and so this is, this is then getting to be a sort of increasingly critical area, right, because as our climate is changing, the uh, extreme events, extreme weather events are becoming more and more common, right? So we're getting yeah. more severe storms, more rain in shorter periods, I guess, 
what is it that I was reading recently that they say something like half of the rain in a given year falls on 12 days or something like that. And that's, that's predicted now to be shrinking down to 11 days or 10 days within the next couple of decades. Um, and that's, of course, that has impacts on your, on, on everything, right? Because the more concentrated your rain is, the more rain's gonna run off if you not soak mm -hmm. in, you're not gonna get as good saturation of the soil, you're gonna get more erosion, all, all these things that, yeah. that have impacts on us, right? Yeah, frequency is important, rain rate is important. Yeah. So what you're referring to is if you have a low frequency, meaning just high rain rates during one period of time as opposed to you know, lower rain rates but more frequent is usually better for plants and animals because like you said it gives the land more time to soak it up and Excellent. isn't as destructive. So we're going we're to dig more deeply into your work when we come back. Right now we're going to have to take a quick break. Again, uh, Allison Nugent uh, is my guest. I'm Ethan Allen here on Likeable Science and we'll be back in one minute. Aloha, I'm Tim Apicella. I'm here with Cynthia Sinclair. And this is Trump Week. It's going to appear every Friday at 11 a.m. Between Jay Fidel, Cynthia, and myself, we talk about Trump, the activities, and the news stories for that week as it pertains to the Trump administration. We hope you tune in and watch the fun. Aloha. See you then. Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. And you're back here on Likeable Science. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on ThinkTech Hawaii. Dr. Allison Nugent is uh, from UH Manoa SOEST, Department of Atmospheric Sciences, <laughs> is with me today. And we're talking about clouds, you yeah. know, great, great stuff. Um, maybe before we jump into this, we, we, we can take a quick look at, the, at our couple, uh, our next video. Uh, we were talking about how clouds are dynamic, mm -hmm. right? And the, the video here shows over, well, tell us here. What, what, yeah, what, this is a time-lapse video over about Half an hour. This is actually the view from my office at UH Manoa, and you can see the clouds are growing and evolving, right. but they're not really moving. Right. Notice they're not. They're not they're, shifting. They're not shifting. They're, they look like they're going to come towards you, but then they don't. Mm -hmm. And this is all related to orographic precipitation. Right, because the air is going or, up, not towards you, basically. Here. Orographic effects. Right. So you have air rising on the windward side. This is mm -hmm. taken from the lee side okay. on the UH Manoa campus. Right. And you have air descending there. So even mm -hmm. though the clouds are trying to move upwards, overall you have downward moving air, oh. which kind of kills the clouds okay. before they're able to make it to the lee side. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay, but well, let's talk a little bit about, about your, your some of your specific projects, you know, things you're working on. Um, so you, you were involved with a project called DOMEX. Yeah, so DOMEX stands for the Dominica experiment, and actually the mm -hmm. video we saw where you could see the aircraft gust probe flying right. through clouds that was from the DOMEX field campaign. Okay, and and sort of what, what were you doing there? What was what was the sort of significance of this? Yeah, the purpose was to look at the physics behind orographic precipitation. Okay. I think if you live on any of the Hawaiian islands, you know that there's a wet side and a dry side, mm -hmm. but you may not know the details of what happens up in the clouds. Mm -hmm. And honestly, some of it is still o an open question for scientists as well. Oh, excellent, excellent. Because you, you use on your website, I know you, you used a, an expression talking about thermally forced convection versus mechanically forced convection. Mm -hmm. and I, I, that, <laughs> To me, it didn't make any sense. I don't, I don't think of air as being mechanically forced, but... Okay, so imagine the trade winds are really strong one day. Okay. So the winds are moving over, they come in, in contact hard. with the right. mountains. They're literally mechanically or physically pushed upwards oh, okay. by coming in contact with the island. Okay, so it's higher pressure behind them always just shoving yeah, them Yeah, just up. shoving them okay. up. Okay, right. versus and it's just lifting because it's warm. Yeah, versus the other case. When the, when the wind speed is low, the air has a lot of time to gain that heat from the island. The island surface is heated by the sun okay. and that the land surface passes it onto the air. And so that air becomes warm, buoyant, and then it rises. So the two types of convection are actually pretty different oh. and they depend on the strength of the trade wind speed. Okay. So right. 
I don't know if you've ever noticed that when there are weak winds, mm -hmm. oftentimes Mililani or the center part of Oahu is more likely to get thunderstorms. Mm -hmm. Whereas when the trade winds are strong, the windward side will be really wet, but the lee side will be really dry. Okay. All of that's related to, to these two different things, whether or not the wind is in control of the lifting of the air or whether the heating from the island is in control. Okay, excellent. And then, then there's the factor of sort of what's in the air, right? the, the, the aerosols, which are, can be a little salt, out here probably a lot of it is little salt particles, right, that are, yeah. that are blown up off the ocean, basically. Uh, all of, lots of other things, because there are viruses and bacteria and <laughs> bits of seaweed, I suspect, and you know, everything else gets blown up too. Uh, and a lot of that ends up from the wind rising to, to some altitude and, and then providing a, a condensation nucleus, as you put it, right? Yeah. 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 So why, why is it that uh, salt is, is of sort of special interest in this, in this process? Yeah, I'm particularly interested in sea salt aerosols, or mm -hmm. tiny particulates of salt. And the reason is because it's been shown that if you have a cloud droplet with salt and a cloud droplet without salt, and you lift them both, the one with salt in it will grow faster than huh. the one without salt. Which makes it more likely to eventually be in a cloud? Oh, which makes it more likely to eventually become a raindrop okay. if it can grow large enough. So there's no there's no distinguishment between or no difference between a cloud droplet and a raindrop. It's just a raindrop okay. falls and a cloud drop is small enough that it remains suspended. So if this cloud droplet can get big enough so that it can fall, okay. then sea salt could be important for creating rain. And that's a big open question in the field. The question of how you get a million cloud droplets to come together in warm rain mm -hmm. to make a raindrop is a big open question. I say warm oh. rain because the ice phase one, once you have really tall clouds where there's ice particles, that's a little bit, uh, well, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> Whereas the question of warm rain when no ice processes are involved, it's either because there's turbulence, and so you have cloud droplets hitting each other and combining right. until eventually they're large enough to fall as a raindrop, mm -hmm. or or it could be because of things like sea salt aerosols that allows these cloud droplets to grow faster than other ones. And they grow faster because the salt is so-called hydroscopic, right? It, want, it, it wants to draw water into it. Itself. Yeah, it wants to draw water in. It also affects the surface tension okay. of the droplet. Right. You know how water has that meniscus in a right. cup? Exactly. Um, imagine the same thing, but in yep. a tiny little cloud droplet. Okay. It can affect how, how that Surface the salty holds water together. has less surface tension? I always get this confused. So if you're trying to boil an egg and you want it to cook at a higher temperature, sure. you put salt in it, oh, okay. which means that it's salt the increases the surface temperature. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Right. I can usually figure it out. I just have to go through <laughs> those steps. Yeah, no, see, this is, this is great. This, this shows how very much how science uh, you know, ties all these different things together, the chemistry, the physics, and, yeah. and this is this is really wonderful. Absolutely, and you don't have to memorize it because all of these things are things that we we know in our daily lives. We just don't yeah. usually apply it to <laughs> cloud droplets. Right, right, and, and no, it, this is it's so intriguing. I, I had no idea that the clouds had there was so much unknown about them. I sort of figured, hey, the clouds have been around. People have studied them well, forever, and they know all about them. If if everything was known, then the poor weather people wouldn't right. get. Right. You know, <laughs> it is interesting, right? They still can't predict weather beyond a fairly limited time frame, right? Uh, and and some of it could be because of things like this. If we don't know exactly what it takes to get a cloud droplet to turn into a raindrop, or how long, or what things affect it, how are you going to be able to predict that a week out? Exactly. There's exactly. so many unknowns, and that's yeah. why we can't predict things exactly. Right. So so real quick here. You also study something that you talk about gravity waves in your, on your website, but I think of gravity waves as being sort of a uh, astronomical cosmological phenomenon. Of, but you, you are you using the term in that same way, gravity? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, so you're referring time. to gravity waves meaning fluctuations in actual gravity, gravity right. whereas I'm in in my field, gravity waves means uh, where gravity is the restoring force. So just like an ocean wave, gravity is the restoring force. Trying to it's flatten a, it back down. It's the same thing, but in the atmosphere, you have a difference between upward motion and gravity okay. being the restoring force of waves. Um, so what, what you're referring to is I was involved in another aircraft field campaign down in New Zealand, 
And actually, the, the local name for New Zealand is Land of the Long White Cloud in their, in their language. And it's because there's an orographic cloud Along always ridge. over the ridgeline. Okay. And um, also upwards in the atmosphere, there's wave fluctuations that you can measure 70, 80 kilometers high in the wow. atmosphere because of this mountain on the ground. And so, um, yeah, that, that was a, a really neat dynamical project where we went and flew at about 12 kilometers height with LIDARs okay. that looked upwards into the atmosphere up to the 70, 80 huh. kilometer height huh. and could see these fluctuations in gravity waves or or waves where the restoring okay. force is gravity. Okay, interesting, intriguing. <laughs> that, that, yeah, so, so You much. never knew that mountains had so much of right? an impact on the atmosphere. Yeah, no, that, that's intriguing that they're, they're literally having impact miles and miles and miles above themselves. Uh, and yeah. yeah, and you've got your, your, your gravity trying to sort of stabilize everything back down, as it were. That's, that's, uh, that's amazing stuff. <laughs> so um, where do you see this research going? Well, just like we talked about, we hope that understanding better how clouds and how rain forms will help to make predictions of weather better or predictions of climate better. If we don't know, you know, each one of these things, it may be nothing or it may be everything. Mm -hmm. And in models, we use parameterizations or estimates to approximate processes. And mm -hmm. if you're not sure how it works, um, those can lead to errors that propagate into the wrong weather forecast for next week. And so a lot of the work that I do is very fundamental. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not going <laughs> to change your life tomorrow, but hopefully it'll lead to these progressive step-by-step -step improvements in understanding the world around us. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here, Allison. This, this was even more enlightening than my usual guests. Uh, you really, really expanded my horizons. Uh, I had up in the clouds. <laughs> Thank so, you so much for having me. Oh, it was a lot of fun. It, it was a pleasure, and, and I look forward to uh, maybe getting you back sometime. We can dig more deeply in the clouds. Of course, yes. Okay. There's, there's, we've barely touched on the surface. We exactly. can go further. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I hope you'll come back and join us uh, next week on another episode of Likeable Science here on ThinkTech Hawaii. Until then. <laughs>